The following audio is from Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Uh, let me give you this morning uh, two scenarios as we, we start now on disciplining your child effectively. And uh, <clears throat> again, we've talked about spending a lot of time here, and uh, I think this one is really important as far as what will follow. We have about five left, and about the next three are very detailed about what it means and how we are to, to discipline in, in the proper way our children. So, so two scenarios. Number one, uh, you have a four-year-old kid, and, and he's running around with scissors. Good idea or bad idea? Bad idea. Yes, very good. You guys have learned quite a bit since we started the class. <laughs> you didn't even hesitate on that. Bad idea. And you say, sweetheart, put the scissors down, and he says, no. And you say, listen, I'm not messing around. Don't make me count to three. Put the scissors down. Right? And, and he stomps his foot and ignores you. And so you begin. One, two, don't make me spank you. I mean it. And that child looks at you in the eyes and turns his back and walks away. And finally, in frustration, you go and you grab the scissors from his hand and you take it from the four-year-old and the problem is solved, right? Not at all. Not at all. You've just had a disobedient child who won that battle. Let me give you another scenario. Maybe for, this will be more appropriate for some of those who are older. You have a 15-year-old and they stay out past curfew. On Monday, and you said, listen, I told you to be home by 10, you get home at 11.15, you're grounded. And now, every day of the week, that child makes your life miserable. They're short with you, they roll your, uh, their eyes, they ignore you, they stomp, they slam the door, um, and, and your life for the entire week is miserable. They're sarcastic, they're mean-spirited, and, and they, they change the whole environment of your house so that by the time Friday comes around, you're just, you've had it, you're finished, you've had enough, and you feel sorry now that you even said you're going to punish that child, and you let them off the hook. I'm sure none of these scenarios happen to anyone in this classroom, but this is a problem. We all have to deal with it, the struggle uh, to get our kids to obey. And sometimes, not only a struggle, but it's excruciating to get our kids to obey. And so, we want to talk about how to do that, to get our kids to mind, without losing our minds. That's, that's the hope, okay? <clears throat> Let me say this this morning. Our parenting approach may be contributing to the problems of discipline in our home. We live in a crazy world today where discipline has become a dirty word, right? We, we say discipline it conjures up these ideas of anger and beating, and, and these things are certainly not biblical. But it could be that the way we, we structure our parenting within our home are actually counterproductive to what we're doing. So we're going to talk about that today and hopefully lay a foundation uh, for what true biblical discipline is all about. So, number one, if you look at your sheet this morning, <laughs> and your sheet's somewhat different than mine, so I'm not exactly sure, but you should have space on there, I think, at the bottom of your sheet. To write a little graph, if you can, if you can't see it, it's not that difficult. There are two arrows up and down. We make a little box here. 100 at the top, 0 at the bottom. This, this uh, line going uh, vertical is a line of love. 0 meaning couldn't care less, right? Neglectful, non-attentive. To, and this is for parents. To 100 being I can't quit hugging my kid enough every time I see them. Okay, Those are the extremes. This line is discipline or control from zero, meaning do whatever you want, to 100, meaning you are a dictator, right? You are like an Adolf Hitler. When you say jump, they say how high, okay? And you'll notice on this little graph, it goes from zero to 100, zero to 100, and as you move this way, you have love and control sort of maximized here. So here's what this graph means. Years ago, a psychologist um, named Reuben Hill... Uh, did a study in Minnesota, all right? And in Minnesota, he did a study of a 1,000 teenagers and their parents and just examined how they interacted, how they disciplined their children. And, and here's what he found. He found four different styles of parenting that I think will be helpful just to see this morning. And as we go through this, I want you to think about how you were parented and, and how you parent and see where on this little chart you find yourself, okay? 
And don't get nervous. This is not a psychology class. This is an interesting study, but I think it will help us as we view Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. So the first group is parents, all right? The permissive parent. And this is a parent who is high in love, right? Love is 100 here, but low in discipline. High in love, low in discipline. They produce kids with low self-esteem and feelings of inferiority. This is a test. This was a, a, a research of a thousand, over a thousand teens and their parents. Uh, why the insecurity? A lack of boundaries. No boundaries. Do what you want. I love you. Don't want to you know, mess up your mojo here. We don't want to rock the boat. Do what you want. These children are loved, but never know their limits. Um, Chip Ingram calls these parents fearful parents. They're afraid to say no. They're afraid to rock the boat. They, they really don't want their children ever, ever to be upset with them. And so that was the first group that he found. <laughs> the second group, group number two, were the neglectful. Oh, that's right. Okay. Neglectful parents, right? Um, and these are the parents uh, who produce, they're the worst of all four categories. They produce kids with little or no lasting relationship. Neglectful. And, and it may be unintentional that they're neglectful. They may have their own chaos in life. Maybe an abusive situation, maybe alcohol, drug abuse, whatever. Maybe just never taught. Maybe they, get, they started a family at 15 years old. But they're negligent or neglectful. These parents seem to have children with deep emotional scars. And again, Ingram calls these forsaking parents. They have their own issues to deal with, and the kids are not even on the radar, right? These are the kids who are out all day long that no one knows who their parents are or what's going on in their lives, okay? Number three, authoritarian. Authoritarian, down in this quadrant right here. This was the, th- the third class of parenting. Um, they don't express love and affection well, but they are high in discipline, right? See that on the chart? No, not too good on the love, but man alive, they got things under control. These are the parents uh, that produce kids um, who uh, are provoked to rebellion. Parents don't have conversations with their kids. They tell them, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and that's it. And that continues until they're 18 and 19 years old. They're high on, you must do this, but they also produce a strong sense of safety, This parent doesn't just want to win the war. They want to win every small skirmish. Everything. They're in this kid's face all the time. All the time. And when they communicate, if they communicate, it is angry and it's fighting. Especially as these kids get older. They've had enough of this. And by the time they're 18, these kids can't wait to leave their homes. Okay? Number four. This was the fourth fourth group. that. Oh, I should tell you what kind of kids they call, parents they call these. These are called fighting parents. Everything's a fight. And the fourth one, which of course is the best one, is the one that I think we'd all like to say this is how we parent, or we would like to parent, is the authoritative. A big difference here. This is the best combo. They are compassionate, yet they are firm in their authority. These parents produce high self-esteem with good coping skills. There are clear boundaries, but also they are very loving. And, they call, and Ingram calls these fellowshipping parents, all right? And so this is what Reuben Hill decided after studying a 1,000 kids and their parents and how they interacted. And I think it would be surprising to you that as you look at this list, I'm sure that somewhere on, in this you know, quadrant here, you would find the way that you were raised. Permissive parents, maybe authoritarian parents, maybe neglectful parents. Maybe you had it perfect here, not perfect, but authoritative parents. So now the question is, how are are you parenting? Now, we would all like to believe this is where we're at, and hopefully we are there. But I wonder this morning, what is our default setting? Where do we find ourselves in this little quadrant here as we raise our kids? Where, where do you tend to, to slip in this area? I was trying to think about this in my own life. 
and, and probably for me, it would, I would slip into this, authoritarian. Just do what I said. Now, yes, sir, drill sergeant, right? That would be my default setting. But this is what we see in parenting, and sometimes this is a problem that we have with parenting our kids. We have the wrong program. It just doesn't work, okay? So any comments or questions about that? Tom? I just couldn't say that's a graph or a quadrant, so you can put your dot anywhere. But you can be, Absolutely. If you're at the far corner on this side, you're terrible. You know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> Probably closer to the center of the... Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. No one wants to say, hey, we're over here. We're off the chart on neglecting. But we do fluctuate through this thing, and that's a good point, that sometimes we find ourselves going to different areas, but there's a lot of places we can go in here. That's exactly right. Dan? One thing that I think is interesting that I want to think about it myself is that um, obviously I want to be an authoritative parent, but you feel at different times, for different reasons, pulled in each direction. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you're ever a neglectful parent and you feel like you're pulled toward a good direction. I feel like it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. I think I just said something about us and that like everything good that we're going to accomplish as parents is going to be a fight against our natural nature to try to do what we're going to do. Absolutely. I, I think we have, to, we have to factor in all these things, our own human nature, that, that our default setting is to do nothing, right? Um, and that's a good point. John? Uh, is that a Christian? No, not a Christian. Just a psychologist who did the study. Then that makes a difference as well. Absolutely. But I'll say this to you. It makes a huge difference. And we're going to see in Hebrews the difference in this. But I would say to you, everyone in this room can say, I was raised like this. Uh, at some point on this graph here, that does happen. And, and when it comes to psychology, we don't put all our eggs in the basket. There's certainly not. But it does, it, it's interesting to see how these do affect all of us. We've been here. We've done this. But it does make a difference because in Christ, everything is new, Right. But in Christ, this is, this is where we ought to be, the fellowshipping parent. This is where we ought to be. And so, certainly, our Christian faith makes a huge difference here. But we need to be aware that, that we do have these default settings. That and, and listen, the neglectful one, maybe you're just pulling your hair out of your head, saying, I, I have no idea what to do with these kids. I just want to give up, right? And we find ourselves on all of these dots. So, that's exactly right. It's not a Christian uh, survey by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, the scary thing for me, though, is it's hard in any survey t today when they talk about Christians to even know what a Christian is in their surveys. Um, but this is just uh, a psychologist running a thousand families in Minnesota saying, look, this is what we're finding in this study. All right? So that's the first case study. Take it for what it's worth, but I think it does help us to understand that if I'm raised in this type of setting without any other instruction, my default setting is going to be either I'm going to be an authoritarian parent or permissive because I'm going to rebel against this, right? I'll give you a story about someone that I know. I won't mention any names because it's being recorded. But I know of a family who, for their first two children, were strong on the authoritarian. You're going to get spanked. You're going to do what I say and da-da-da. And then by the time the third one came along, it was like, you know, I'm not sure about that. By the time the fourth child came along, some 15 years later, they were at this mode, right? Permissive. That meant, sweetheart, you can do anything you want to do. Can I tell you something? This doesn't work. And the kids who are best adjusted actually came from this quadrant than this one. Just so that you know. And I'm testifying that I've seen that happen in my own life. Okay? It happened. And so you've you got to be careful because we, we see these things happen. How, how many of you have said this? You've seen something in your mom and dad and you said, I can't stand that and buy, I'm never going to do that. Have you ever said that? Okay, almost everybody. Let me ask you a question if you're old enough now. Have you ever done it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you have. Yeah, because that's our default setting. And unless we start making conscientious decisions by the Spirit of God to change some of those things, we will either... <laughs> Follow what we knew, or we, the pendulum will swing too far the other way. That's what usually happens in our lives. It happens in Christianity. Here's a doctrine, okay? The Pentecostals have robbed us of the joy of expressing praise, and so Baptists will not even raise their hands now in a service. The pendulum has swung too far, right? And we've got to be careful. It happens all the time. It happens in parenting. My parents were this, and I hate that, and I'm not going to do that, and the pendulum swings too far the other way. 
So be careful about those things and, and be aware of those things. So case study one, psychologist, Reuben Hill, Minnesota, interesting. I think you'll find some interesting things about that graph. You can use it forever you want to. Now, case study number two, the book of Hebrews. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. And I'd like somebody in a moment just to read verses 1 through 11. I know it's a lot to read. But you would help me tremendously in a moment to read that. And let me just give you the background of Hebrews chapter 12. Um, we, we come to Hebrews, and um, it's the book, if you remember, about believers now who are young, they're children in their faith, they've not grown up spiritually, and now hard times come, and, and they want to just take off. They want out. They want to turn their backs. And so Hebrews 12 starts out um, by challenging them that you've not resisted yet, you are sons and daughters, and maybe we should, just, we should go there and just read that. So if someone, if someone is at Hebrews chapter 12 this morning, John, just read that nice and loud, verses 1 through 11. All right. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnared us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that is set before him endured the cross, <coughs> despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and discourages every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there from a father who has not chastened? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed be days as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. Here's where Hebrews now talking to this church. He's talking to them as sons. And you know this when you look in the New Testament. You hear the word sons. It's sons and daughters. He's talking to them about, as children now. And he, he makes an interesting quote here from Proverbs 3.11, which every Jew would have understood, the idea about God chastening his children. And here we find he's encouraging them to endure. God is treating you like his own child. His own child. And you're going to find now in verses 7 through 11 that discipline is evidence of love. Interesting, this week I was in the car, listening to the radio, and James McDonald was on, he was talking about parenting, actually. <laughs> and he, he quoted um, an article from Dear Abby, where a, a little, I don't know, 11 or 12-year-old girl wrote in and said, hey, my, my mom or my dad, they don't, they don't discipline us, and it just makes me feel um, not secure. And Dear Abby, who is not a Christian, said, your parents are making a terrible mistake because discipline is evidence of love. That's what, that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. That discipline is evidence that you are loved, right? When it's done compassionately, under control, with consistent boundaries and consequences, and when we focus on our child's best outcome, it's an expression of love, okay? And so... Children left to themselves will do what all people left to themselves in a fallen world will do. They will make bad decisions that will produce pain and turmoil in their lives. <laughs> Discipline is not a dirty word in the Bible. Discipline is what God has given us as parents to make sure our children don't make tragic decisions and painful decisions throughout their life. And so God's word is very specific here on the subject of discipline. So we're going to take a look at it this morning, and here are five distinct characteristics of God's kind of discipline. Now listen, <laughs> when we find in the Bible God dealing with his children, it's imperative for us to take note because he's a good father. And, and that's the father that we want to emulate. And so when we see how God is dealing with his children, 
we need to take note of that as parents and do our best to say, okay, this is what God does with his children. This is what we ought to do with our children. I, I've been amazed going through the Old Testament. I talked about it a little bit this morning. God's graciousness and his mercy and his kindness and his pity. And even when Israel turns their back on him, he goes after them time and time again. And yet he disciplines his children, an expression of love. So here are five things, that <coughs> characteristics of God's kind of discipline. <coughs> and this is foundational. Parents, if you don't get this, the reason behind the discipline, why we do what we do, why God does what he does, then when we get to the next couple of lessons, it won't make sense to you. You won't buy into it. It won't do for you what it needs to do. This is foundational now. Foundational. Number one, uh, discipline is necessary. It's necessary. You are not doing your children any good to be permissive or neglectful, to be their buddy. It doesn't work. There should come a time in your life when your children at a certain age, we have a friendship. And it's a beautiful thing if you do it right. That when they're older, when they're married, when they're out of the house, now you communicate with them because you've been faithful and consistent. They come back and they ask you questions. They seek your counsel. It's a wonderful thing. But when they're growing up, they do not need a buddy. Discipline is necessary. Why? Because it deters destruction. Look back at our text, verse number 4. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. In the context, chapter 10 starts, and at the end of chapter 10, the writer is saying, listen, um, be careful. Those who despise God are destroyed. Those who turn back are destroyed. We are not like that. Verse 11 then gives us, or chapter 11 gives us examples of men and women um, who are faithful to God's promises. And in chapter 12, it continues with the encouragement to live a courageous, faithful life. And what he's saying here is that disciplined lives reap reward. (laughs) So don't be weary in this. Discipline is necessary. It's necessary. Too many of us this morning are afraid of making our children mad or upset or rocking the boat. Listen, if we understand that this discipline is necessary, it's okay when they say, I hate you, I can't stand you, I don't even love you anymore. Because you will know that what you're doing later on, they will look back and know that you did what was necessary for them. Your kids can say some nasty things, man. Your kids can break your heart. right? But if you understand that discipline is necessary, I don't do this because I enjoy this, and I, I, you know, I want my little, I'm the drill sergeant, and when I say jump, you're going to jump. I do this because it's necessary. And if you do it right, I promise you, when your kids are old enough, they will understand that it was necessary, especially when they get their own children. It's one of the blessings of the curse. I hope you have kids just like you. (laughs) Because that's what happens. And they say, oh, Mom and Dad, you were right. I was terrible. And I can't believe how smart you were at that point. Okay, it is necessary Don't be weary in this. You, as a parent, must understand and know that the discipline of your child is necessary, and you are called to do it. John? We have to understand that uh, we are born in sin, conceived in sin, and that sin nature takes over immediately upon birth. If you play that sin nature out to its completion without intervention, you see our jails. Absolutely. You see murder in the streets. You see the mafia. You see that to its end. Mm-hmm. So our job is obviously not to make that happen because that's not what God wants produced. Exactly right. So the discipline takes care of that sin nature to a point. Absolutely. That's right. That's the external restraints there to deter evil. Um, and, John, you're exactly right. We're, you know, we, we drive. We're going to be leaving this morning for the, to go down to Cleveland for the funeral. And again, we'll drive through Detroit. Detroit's a mess. I think Detroit is an example of just human nature at its worst, man. And left to ourselves, we reap destruction and pain and chaos. It's it's chaos. And it's your job to take that little child that looks so sweet with a sinful, wicked heart that's prone and bent to rebellion to help him understand that 
Disobedience always brings destruction and pain and sorrow. And we're not helping them if we don't see the necessity of what we're doing by letting them do whatever they want to do. It's counterproductive. And you will produce children who will make poor life choices and cause themselves lots of pain and suffering. Parents, you cannot live for the moment. You, you can't. You've got to live for the future. You've got to live for the big picture. And the big picture is God says, this is how God treats his children. I want to deter you from destruction. Therefore, I am going to discipline you. Discipline. So it's necessary. You've got to get it. That's for, you need to understand, as we work through this lesson, it's necessary. Kim? Um, how there, I remember these times where I would just try to keep them happy. Like, I just, you know, okay, well, do you want this? Do you want that? And I can specifically remember thinking to myself, what am I doing? This child needs discipline. And the kid was miserable. And then disciplining the child and the child's heart changing where it was like, he, it was like, okay, I, I was wrong. I, you know, I, I was acting like a, a fool, mm-hmm. and I needed some discipline. And there was harmony again in the house. But like up until that point, it was like I was, you know, dancing, doing all kinds of things, trying to keep my happy. And I was so miserable and so upset with myself. And then it's like, do this right. And then it's your kid's heart. It's like they need that. Absolutely. And here's the truth. You might not know this, and they may not say it, <clears throat> but our children are crying out for order, structure, boundaries and someone to tell them no. They, they need someone to say no. And it is amazing. We dance around our children. We jump through hoops. This happens all the time. Go to Walmart, right? Aisle five. Here's a mom promising everything to this child. And, 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 but here's the problem. It's never enough. And, and that candy bar at three years old gets bigger. And they get more fights as they go on in this deal. And when they're teenagers... It's not as easy as sort of conjoling them and trying to make it all come. And, and it's not our job to make their life happy. It's to direct them toward holiness. And so, and it is, it's, it's amazing that when the brokenness of discipline happens, harmony and peace are restored within the home. It has to be done. It is necessary. You've got to get it necessary. Okay? And don't, don't be so arrogant to think that we know more than God. If this is what God does for his children, if he knows this is what we need to deter us from destruction, then certainly we should open our eyes and say, God, if this is how you deal with me, help me then deal with my child the same way. It is necessary. Good. Necessary. Anything else with that? (coughs) Number two, the means of discipline. Discipline is action and words. Verse 5 is a quote from Proverbs chapter 3. And those two words that are used there for chastening and rebuke are action and words. It means that as I'm disciplining my children, there are warnings and consequences. And this makes most people cry when you say this point. Warnings and consequences. All right? They need to be warned. (laughs) This is poor Chase. I don't know. He can come back in here. Um, He'll be fine. I don't know what's happening, but he'll be fine. All right? Um, Warnings. This is how we operate. This is what we do. These are warnings. But now listen. Your warnings mean nothing without consequences. You can talk into the air. Because if you warn that kid and you warn that kid and you warn that kid and there's never a consequence, then you're a fool. And they know it. You have taught them, or rather they have taught you, that they will listen when you finally explode or blow up or throw something or lose control. We practice warning and consequences, chastening and rebuke, action and words. That's the means of discipline. It's not real complicated, right? (laughs) And let me just say, you you ought to have, there shouldn't be 10,000 rules in your home, right? Like, like you have a wall and you have a list of 1 through 20 on Monday. and You don't need to do that. They should be simple and easy. But there should be warnings and consequences. In our home, we had three, really three rules in our homes. In our home. Number one, no lying. No lying. You can't help a liar. Some of your parents, you let your kid lie to you and you know they're lying and you let them go at that. 
they become emboldened to be better liars. You can't help a liar because they're never wrong. It's never their fault. Someone else did it. Don't start that habit early or they'll be doing it in their 30s and 40s. No lying. Um, no punching or hitting one another. I have three sons, right? And they wrestle and they, they box and they play sports, but they're not going to resolve conflict by punching each other or getting mad or grabbing the younger one and throwing him across the room. Not that they didn't do that, <laughs> but they weren't allowed to do those things. And then number three was no direct disobedience, which is really a funny one because it covers everything, right? The no direct disobedience. But those were three simple things. And here was the deal. If you break these, these are consequences. Now, of course, they morph later on, and you, you have to do different things as they change in their age, but keep it simple. This is the means. We use words and warnings and actions, okay? Questions or comments? Number three, the motive of love. It's an expression of love. John read it earlier, verses 6 through 9. John, would you read those again? Right. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom the Father does not chasten? If you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, they are legitimate and of sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrupted us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Amen. It's an expression of love. When we say, I'm going to give you another chance, and we neglect to set those boundaries um, that let our kids know they're safe, we're not, we're not expressing love at all. One of the most powerful ways to love your kid is to be consistent in your discipline. And this is hard. Kim said it earlier, you, you want to jump through hoops, you want it to make their life okay, but we've got to be consistent because this consistency expresses love. It expresses love. Um, and again, there are times that your kid should be furious with you. They should be furious with you. It means you're doing something right. It does. And, and you love them enough to see through this situation and say, you can be mad, you can be angry, everybody else can be doing it. If you want to have this attitude in the house while you're here, we're going to fight you on this, but I love you too much to leave you like this. Listen, look at your kids. You see already patterns and habits in their life now at 3, 5, 7, and 10. You see them. It's clear to you. You live with those kids. You know it. And it is not loving to ignore those patterns or habits to try to correct those things. That's your job. That's why we talk to our kids. We sit with our kids. We spend time with them so we can see where their bent is and what direction they're headed to say, wait a minute, I've noticed this. I had to grab my 16-year-old the other day and say, hey, listen, here's a couple things we need to work on because I've noticed this. It'd be easy to ignore it. It'd be easy not to talk about it. We might be closer buddies if we did that, but it's not helping him. It's just not. And so it's necessary it's warning and consequence, but it's a means, it's an expression of love. Love your kids enough to correct them. Love them enough to be consistent at it. Love them enough when you're weary and you think, how many more times am I going to have to do this tonight to do it again? David, he was, there was a spell in David's life, and they all did this. They say terrible twos. I don't know if we had terrible twos. We had terrible one, three, and then 18. <laughs> um, but, but, but David went through a spell where, I mean, you could tell him something and he knew the consequences and he'd get the consequences and he'd do it again. And he'd get the consequences, he'd do it again. And, and he'd get the consequences and he'd do it again. And by this time you're thinking, am I going to kill this kid? Is, is this, he just isn't getting it. And we do the consequences and the consequences and a talk and a consequence. And finally, he would break. And when he broke, it was sweet. Because that will, that, that's, hey, if you're a hard head, and some of you are, I'm looking around, your kids are the same way. And, and those, those attributes that you have, they have. And those attributes aren't terrible things. They can be wonderful things. They have to be directed the right way. And so expression of love is this consistency in discipline. That's our motive. <clears throat> Number four, <clears throat> the goal of discipline. We are to teach obedience. To teach obedience. Um, 
Godly submission is what we're to teach them. Uh, and it starts at just doing what I tell you to do. Parent, you have one job. Teach your kid to obey. Easy, right? No, it's not. But it's the one thing you have to do. He's called your children to obey. We talked about Ephesians 6 a little while back. And uh, it's the one command given to children. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. That's your job. And if you can get streamlined and focus on this one thing, I got this kid now from zero to five, obedience, obedience, obedience. That is our goal. And then number five, <laughs> the results, the results. Short-term pain, long-term gain. That's what God says in verses 10 and 11. It's interesting, he says, all discipline is grievous. All of it. Not some of it, not a little bit of it, all of it. It's all grievous. Whether you're doing it or receiving it, it's grievous. It's all grievous. But we look to the results. <laughs> Will you love them? Love them enough to be consistent, knowing short-term pain produces long-term gain. And as you're disciplining your children, you have to remember that as I do this, there will be a day that they look back and are thankful that I love them enough to save them from some of the, the tragic consequences in life. In life. Now listen, <laughs> as we talk about discipline, <clears throat> it's not difficult. And it's not like, well, you're doing this to your children. When you set boundaries in your home with clear rules, it means that the only time your children are ever disciplined, the only time, is not when you're mad or bent out of shape or you've been screaming for an hour and now you're frustrated or they caught you on the wrong side of the bed. The only time they're disciplined when you do this right is when they decide they need it. Because you were clear on what the instructions were. You were clear on the warning and all they have to do is follow that. But when they don't follow it, they have decided for you. You don't even have to make the decision. They have decided that I need to be disciplined now because I believe I'm bigger than this family. I'm the most important person in the world. Your, your words don't matter. Uh, I will do what I want to do. And so when this is done right, it's not that you're doing this and you're making the decision and it's some kind of, you know, I just feel like it now. Guy at work was mean to me, so hey, come here, you're getting disciplined. That's not how it works. The only time your kids will ever be disciplined is when they make the decision to step out of those clear-cut boundaries. All right, Kim? I think that's why um, being clear is so important. I, when they do step out of, outside of those boundaries, when you say, what have you done? And then they tell you what, they, what they've done, and then say to them, so what happens when you do this? They know. I mean, it's not because you're not freaking out. It's This is the consequence of doing this. You knew what was going to happen when you did this. Absolutely. And that helps us. That takes the emotion, the frustration uh, out of all of that. It helps us control ourselves saying, wait a minute, this is what the rules and the law of the land were. This is where you failed in this area. What are the consequences? And they're the one telling you now, this is exactly what I need. Good. Any other questions or comments? Linda? Um, towards the end of my teaching career, well, about 10 years before I stopped, I, I learned a lot of... Um, brain psychology, and I know this isn't biblical, but it, it actually helped me as a parent and as a teacher that, um, see, the female brain, the cerebral cortex of the brain is what gives you the uh, reasoning skills, and in a female, it develops or matures a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. So at the age of 15, 16, the cerebral cortex of a female is a lot more developed than a male. <coughs> and uh, the female um, usually matures by about the age of 21 or so, and it's, it's pretty um, developed at that stage. A male does not completely develop to 25. So what does that mean? At the age of 14, 15, males especially, I always wondered, why are these guys in grade 9 and 10 just doing all these stupid things? And it's, it's partly because physiology um, is the reason behind it somewhat, in that 
they don't have the ability, their neurons are not developed to figure out the consequences of their behavior, mm -hmm. right? Right. So if I, you know, if it says I've got a curfew at 11, they can't figure out all of those things that are going to happen to them if they come in at 12, mm -hmm. right? Or if they <coughs> go out and they drink or take drugs or, you know, right. the get into sexual relations. It's it's the satisfaction of the moment right. with them. So in terms of discipline, you've got to set those rules somewhat because you've got to be that authoritarian right. person because they can't figure out the consequences. Right? Exactly right. And that just helped me because I always think, why are these grade nine and 10 boys like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And as a supply teacher, I could tell you so many stories mm -hmm. of what these guys are like in class. Right. And I have to be like that authoritarian. <laughs> sure. I'm not showing a lot of love at all. No, absolutely. And, and here's the deal, right? The authoritative one here is, is understanding this because you're right. It, it, there's a funny little clip on why guys die sooner than women because they do dumb things. And they're, they're, I mean, they're really dumb things like Shazam, this is a really good idea. The 24 year old, right, who's cutting off the, the, the limb as he's on the edge of it, right? They're stupid. That's why, but it is, it's why. It is. That's why this is what we need. This fellowshipping with our kids saying, listen, you might not see this now, but this is why we're doing this. At, at age 14 and 15, we've moved from just, I'm doing to, I'm telling you, therefore do it, to I'm saying, listen now, this is why we do this. These are the consequences that come with this type of action and behavior. When you make this decision, whatever the decision is, this is what happens. And this is why we've set these boundaries and rules in your life. Because you don't know. You can't figure it out. And they, boys are stupid. That uh, you, you sit there and you think, it's, their, it's like, what are you thinking? And they're not. And, and that's why they're not. That's, that's right. And that's why they have parents. That's why they have a father and a mother who say to them, listen, we love you. Your brain is mush right now. It's not developed. We're trying to help you to save you so you live past 25. Right? And that's what we're talking about. Love them enough to know. That they do, and that's why, I mean, that's why women's insurance is always cheaper, you know, right? Because guys are, Wah! it's they're dumb. They need you. You, you, have, you are the one person in the world that has been given to them to tell them no, to give them boundaries, to instruct them. That's your job. And we can't fail in this area. We just can't. Okay, good. Any other comments or questions before we... Good. Appreciate everything that's said this morning. All right. Picnics this afternoon. God bless you. Let's go to the next service.